gentlemen, welcome colleagues. Um, it's wonderful to see such a huge gathering for uh, this year's Ventris Lecture. These lectures which take place in memory of Michael Ventris take place every two years in the Institute of Classical Studies and they're, if you like, the high point of a cycle of activity on the Bronze Age which the Mycenaean Seminar sustains through the years. And all of those seminars tend to involve inviting distinguished scholars who work on the Aegean Bronze Age, active researchers usually, archaeologists, um, and occasionally philologists where Linear B and Ventris did himself. But the Ventris lecture really is the high spot, and so it's appropriate that we have for it Professor Joseph Marin from the University of Heidelberg. Professor Marin is director of an excellence cluster on Asia and Europe in a global context, and he does have a truly global view. He's also got a very wide range of excavation activity, um, excavations in Hesse, as well as uh, much more recently uh, the campaigns that he's led at Tiran's uh, since the late 1990s. Uh, as the director of the Excellence Cluster, he is one of those who has been pushing forward um, new theoretical approaches within European and German archaeology, uh, particularly interested in materiality and practice and looking at innovation and other questions which could be applied to almost any area of our disciplines. Uh, but it's particularly for his work um, in Tyrans that we have celebrate him today. Um, Tyrans, um, I sometimes used to think was the sort of Cinderella site of the European bro of the Aegean Bronze Age because he doesn't appear in Homer and the Monuments quite as frequently <laughs> as some others. But it's Cinderella no more because in a series of long campaigns and publications, Professor Marin and his colleagues have really brought this site to life in an extraordinary way. Uh, we're very glad indeed to have you with us. I um, want to welcome you to give the 2017 Michael Ventris Memorial Lecture. Professor Marin. <laughs> Professor Wolf, thank you very much for this generous introduction and above all for the invitation to give this Michael Ventris Memorial Lecture. It is with great pleasure that I accepted the invitation um, because this was the place where some 15 years ago I gave my first mm -hmm. overview lecture to the English-speaking academia on uh, the excavations in Tiryns. This was the Mycenaean Seminar then in 2002. And um, I know from my experience then, but also from hearing from other colleagues, that um, lecture events such as the Michael uh, Ventris Memorial um, Lecture and the Mycenaean Seminar, that they have made this Institute of Classical Studies a hub for the promotion of Mycenaean studies worldwide. And, um, it's my conviction that uh, one particular person, one particular person's lifetime's achievement is it, it, it was that this became possible, and this is Dr. Olga Krzyzkowska, and even <coughs> starting, I wanted to thank her profusely for everything she has done for Mycenaean studies. Thank you, Olga. <laughs> now, in Mycenaean studies, we are, and in Mycenaean archaeology in particular, we are deeply indebted to Michael Ventris for his decipherment um, of Linear B as Greek, which made it possible to get invaluable insights on Mycenaean society and economy and culture, which we otherwise wouldn't have known. Given the increase of knowledge about Mycenaean societies gained through the decipherment of Linear B, it is somewhat ironic that the Argolid has not provided us with a palatial archive. I say this because the Argolid um, could be seen as the core region of Mycenaean Greece, not only because it was from there that Mycenaean archaeology took its start, but it's also the region with the highest density of Mycenaean centers. 
In the absence of a linear B archive, our judgment about the political structure of this Mycenaean argolith ultimately has to rely solely on archaeological evidence. This also applies to the reconstruction of the processes that led to the emergence of the political geography of the Mycenaean argolith during the palatial period, and to addressing the important question why certain sites rose in importance while, uh, while others stalled or even declined. Let me give you a five-minute tour throughout the chronology of Mycenaean Greece um, so that I clarify the terms I will use. The Middle Bronze Age is called the Middle Helladic, then comes starts the Late Helladic period, with the, which is subdivided into three main stages. The early Mycenaean period is the time of the shaft graves of Mycenae, for instance. Then comes the palatial period, roughly between 1400 and 1200 BCE, which is uh, terminated by a destruction horizon around 1200 BCE, in which the palaces in the Argolith, but also arguably in other regions, were destroyed. How contemporary these destructions were, we do not know. This is not the end of Mycenaean culture. It goes on, continues in the post-palatial period without written documents, without palaces, but nevertheless very uh, interesting, as I will try to convince you. And then around in, within the 11th century uh, comes the transition to the early Iron Age. <coughs> it is a fact that the special position of the Argolith within the Mycenaean world stands out from the very beginning of the late Helladic period. In contrast to other regions, the Argive plain shows no evidence for the coexistence of several equal ranking early Mycenaean centers, from which over time only some prevailed. Instead, already during the shaft grave period, Mycenae seems to have held a dominant position which it consolidated, gradually expanding its grip on neighboring regions. As historical change rarely fo follows a lin linear trajectory, but is rather accompanied by twists and turns, often leading to unforeseen consequences, it is particularly important not to impose simplistic and allegedly generally applicable narratives of historical evolution. For instance, when dealing with the palatial polities that have emerged in different regions of Greece as of the late 15th century, a gradual evolution in growth and significance of the later palatial centers <coughs> since Middle Helladic times is often tacitly assumed. Indeed, palaces such as Thebes in Boeotia and Pylos in Messenia may be candidates for such a notion of a continuous rise from already existing powerful Middle Helladic predecessors. Yet, a closer look at the settlement history of other palatial centers reveals that such a continuity may not have been the rule, and that in some cases the notion of evolution does not provide a suitable framework to explain the rise of certain sites. Instead, the agency of social groups appears to be the main factor prompting unexpected ruptures that decisively changed the course of history. I would argue that the rise of Mycenae and Tyrants exemplifies such a major shift in the political <coughs> landscape of the transition between the Middle and Late Helladic periods. In the Argolith, this transition seems to have been accompanied by a radical transformation of the settlement system. During the Middle Helladic, the two most important sites were situated in the western half of the Argive plain, with Argos serving as the regional center and Lerna as its harbor. Uh, here you see a overview of the um, late Middle Helladic and Late Helladic ones settlement on top of the Aspis Hill in Argos. And this is one of the most unusual uh, late Middle Helladic settlements we know from Greece. So clearly Argos was a major center and Lerna uh, in all probability served as its harbor. From the shaft grave period <coughs> onwards, however, the center of gravity has shifted to the eastern half of the plain, thanks to the rise of Mycenae and later of Tyrants. That these two particular sites became the most important Mycenaean centers is surprising, since there are no signs that they were of exceptional importance during the preceding Middle Helladic period. 
Accordingly, their outstanding political uh, position during the late Hellenic seems unlikely to have been the result of some continuous and gradual evolution. Rather, Mycenae and Terence may have each been selected by outside groups uh, desirous of developing them as new centers. And in my opinion, Terence was the center being developed from Mycenae and under the rule of Mycenae. This I will try to show. Particularly, the rise of Terence to the position of the second palatial center is enigmatic. Um, Terence is today about 1.8 kilometers from the sea shore, but in the third millennium, there's the present coast, but in the third millennium BCE, during the early Helladic period, the coast came quite close to the site, to the hill, about 500, 600 meters, and in late Helladic times, it was also closer to the site than today, at a distance of about one kilometer, 1.2 kilometers. This is based on geo geoarchaeological uh, research un undertaken in the 1980s by Eberhard Zander. So it was clearly a harbor, a harbor site. The Acropolis of Tyrins <coughs> is subdivided into several parts. The upper citadel, on which the palace is situated, the middle citadel, of which we know relatively little, and the elongated lowest part of the Acropolis, the so-called Lower Citadel, and please do not confuse this with the Lower Town, which is the area surrounding the Acropolis Hill. So Lower Citadel and Lower Town are two different things. Although Tyrion seems to have been inhabited during most of the Middle Helladic, until now no indications suggesting a special significance of the site during the period have emerged. Thus, all attempts have failed to establish a line of continuity of imposing architecture reaching back to the Shaftgrave period or even the Middle Helladic. It is not a coincidence that in Tyrion's there is nothing even remotely resembling early Mycenaean monuments such as the two grave circles or the earliest Tholos tombs of Mycenae. Tyrion seems to have gradually grown in importance in the course of the 15th century and then suddenly emerged as a second palatial center in the 14th century, as documented by the construction of the first Megaron palace, to which I will turn uh, soon. That the rise of Tyrians during the 15th century can be explained solely as the outcome of local events, <coughs> I consider as highly unlikely. Instead, I assume that the site was either already at that time under the rule of Mycenae or allied with it, and was systematically developed by Mycenae to become a major port and a second center. Possibly, the initial choice for Mycenae's harbor was not Tyrians, but Nauplia, or Nauplion. The little that we know about Mycenaean Nauplia underlines that especially for late Helladic II, that is late 15th century, but also the early 14th, cent early 14th century, late Helladic 3a, the discoveries from both burial and settlement contexts attest to its participation in wide-ranging trade activities. The finds indeed exceed in quality everything from the contemporary chamber tombs um, in Terence here you see a selection of recently published finds from a find spot close to the shoreline at that time in Nauplia uh, with transport vessels um, found together, my own transport vessels and one canonite jar from the Levant and weights also related to trading activities found in the same context, all from Nauplia. In the course of the 14th century, the first great megaron was built at Tyrrhens. There's a strong tendency in research of identifying the megaron as a purely Helladic mainland architectural form that developed continuously out of earlier mainland Greek predecessors. In Tyrrhens, however, there is no sign of a continuous evolution of the megaron palace out of earlier predecessors. On the contrary, the break could not have been stronger because a radically new palatial concept focusing on the Megaron as the central building was imposed. The first great Megaron anticipated in its measurements and the subdivision of its ground plan in uh, three parts, namely
namely the porch, a porch opening to a courtyard, uh, the antechamber and the throne room already in every respect its successor, the later Megaron, but it was situated a few meters to the south in comparison to the later. So you see here underneath the, um, the, the, er the later Megaron and this is the earlier Megaron. It was not exactly in the same position. Prior to the construction of the first Megaron in the 14th century, the remains of an entirely differently structured predecessor, non-Megaron predecessor, were dismantled and its upper terrace raised and leveled in order to create the unified space needed to construct the first Megaron. And we uncovered remains of this building in the porch of the great Megaron, the, the later great Megaron. And it's, uh, it was a, t a, a building, remains of a building with a staircase leading up to, a, to an upper terrace. And the whole building was, with the exception of these remains, um, dismantled when the first Megaron was superimposed on totally different architecture. Although we do not have comparable detailed insights for the building history of the Megaron at any other palatial center, for certain reasons I doubt that someday in Mycenae or Pylos, the other palaces where Megaron, where a Megaron is um, present, uh, represented, I doubt that in these other palaces all elements of the palatial Megara of the 14th and 13th centuries will be traced back to early Mycenaean roots. Indeed, rectangular buildings with half rooms had a long tradition on the Greek mainland. Yet, the Megaron palaces, and you can see here um, an example from Middle Helladic Northern, Northern Greece, a site, a site I was working on as my dissertation, Pefkakia Magula, and you see here a, a megaroid building with a central half room, as the Mycenaean Megara also have such half rooms. Um, yet the Megaron palaces of the 14th century were, in my opinion, a reinvention based on a transcultural process in which architects, designers, and builders deliberately merged mainland Greek architectural elements, such as the central half in the central room, but with such features of Minoan derivation. In my opinion, the emergence of the Megaron as a normative architectural form, and you see here the three known Megara, um, was this, the emergence of this architectural form was directly linked with a shift in the political relations between elites of um, the Greek mainland and Crete, as a result of which Cretan centers, after the destruction of the palace of Knossos at the end of the Minoan monopalatial phase, that is somewhere within the first half of the 14th century, were downgraded, these Minoan centers were downgraded to the status of basals of Mycenaean palaces who had to send tributes. It is, in my opinion, not, no coincidence that exactly at the time of the building of the first Megara on the Greek mainland within the 14th century, um, an influx of Cretan transport jars that's in, especially to palaces of the Argolid, but also in, in Boeotia, not to Mycenae. <coughs> Um, some of them linear B inscribed, and these inscriptions were in research mostly interpreted as some sort of advertisement for, the, for certain brands, for certain um, um, regions on Crete with a very good uh, olive oil or, or wine. In my opinion, this is modern thinking. And uh, I would argue that these place names and personal names um, were meant to signify to the palatial administration on the mainland pal palaces from where the tribute came. The positioning of the throne on the right-hand side of the uh, throne of the main room of Mycenaean palatial Megara and the framing of the um, of the of the throne with a, by a wall painting with a griffin in the Megaron of Pylos, emphasized that certain features of the layout of the main Mycenaean palatial buildings followed the design of the Knossos throne room. 
So it is very typical for Mycenaean palatial Megara that they have the throne on the right-hand side, in Mycenaean Megara facing the half. But, in, but the basic outline of this, this, of this organization with the throne on the right-hand side is already pre-configured in the case of the throne room at Knossos. Um, and also where you see the throne over here and uh, the fresco throne fresco composition as is known for a long time in Pylos for instance with a griffin um, right next to the throne is very close to the one at Knossos. Um, it seems to me that the construction of the Megara was meant to express the new confidence of Mycenaean rulers and to signify the transfer of religious political power from Knossos to the mainland palaces. So in my opinion, a, um, <coughs> um, the Mycenaean palaces, they destroyed Knossos, and then the power, center of power was shifted to the Greek mainland, and the first Megaron palaces were built as some sort of new Knossos on the Greek mainland. In addition to the issue of the origin of the architectural form of the palatial Megaron, the question arises why this particular plot of the upper citadel of Tiryns was chosen in the 14th century for constructing the first Megaron. As is well known, the successive Mycenaean great Megara of the 14th and 13th century have been built exactly on the same spot where roughly a thousand years earlier during the early Helladic period, uh, the so-called Rundbau had stood. So this is the Megaron of the, the great Megaron of the 13th century, the little Megaron of the of the um, of the 13th century. Both Megaron structures had a, a court in front of them, a great court for the great Megaron and a smaller one for the for the little Megaron. But strikingly but strikingly, right beneath the Great Megaron is this tower-like structure with a diameter of more than 25 meters dating 1,000 years earlier. It's a so-called Rundbau, a circular, circular building. Today's visitor in Tiryns is struck by two intriguing features. The first, the first feature is that, <coughs> perhaps we stay in the other photograph. Um, you look, we see here the part of the Rundbau of the third millennium BCE un uncovered in this particular area in the court of the Little Megara. The excavators, German excavators in 1911-12 were quite surprised to find this structure and even today it's, it's striking for several reasons. The first reason is that the mud brick superstructure of this tower-like building is clearly recognizable even today and stands to a significant height. The second feature is, and for this we should look at the <coughs> earlier excavation photos from 1912, you see here mud brick features um, of the Rundbau and the wall of the Great Megaron. So what is really striking is that the wall of the first great Megaron of the 14th century was built about five centimeters, and I've calculated this according to the heights of the old and uh, old excavations, was the, the floors contemporary with the first Megaron buildings in the 14th century were inserted at a height of about five centimeters above the, the upper, upper part of the mud brick um, remains of the Rundbau, although it was thousand years earlier. How is this possible? There's another very strange fact, namely that in this whole area of the where the, the Rundbau was uncovered in the time before the First uh, World War, there was no superimposed architecture preserved between the <coughs> Megaron buildings of the 14th and 13th centuries and the building dating to about 2500-2400 BCE, which was destroyed around 2200 BCE. Except for this wall, a segment of a rounded wall here. This wall was always thought to belong to a house. A later house built sometimes at the end of the early Helladic, at the end of the third millennium, or in the middle Helladic period. 
And it could be, it, it was possible that it belongs to a house because such, such bent walls could belong to so-called abscidal buildings or oval buildings, which we know from both periods. However, if this would have been the case, this abscidal building would have had to interfere in the process of building and using it with the ruin of the, of the Rundbau. But if you look carefully in, in, on this, in the remains, you will see that exactly the contrary is true. You see here again this segment of the, of the curved wall, and where in the area here, which where the floor of this building would have been preserved, there's absolutely, um, there are absolutely well-preserved remains of the mud brick structure of the Rundbau uh, preserved to a significant height of even higher than this wall. So every excavator would conclude it's impossible that this ever belonged to a building because the floors would have to interfere with this mud brick superstructure. The fact that the mud brick superstructure of the Rundbau is preserved in this area means that this cannot be part of, a, of a, the wall of a house. It must be something different. And in my opinion, it's a boundary wall of a tumulus. A tumulus formed out of the ruin of the Rundbau, of the Rundbau, this huge building. Here you see again another beautiful photo um, of the remains in the in the courtyard of the of the little Megaron seen from the great Megaron with the remains of the of the mud brick walls, this the bent wall mm -hmm. and here other walls of the Rundbau. And of course, the, and we are able to reconstruct the approximate size on the basis of this boundary wall, the approximate size of this of this tumulus. We know such tumuli, such mounds, ritual mounds, we know from other sites. In the vicinity, very close to, to Tyrans, on the other side of the Bay of Nafplion is Lerna, the famous House of the Tiles tumulus, formed out of the ruin of, the, of, the, of another monumental building contemporary with the Rundbau. And recently, some years ago, the excavations of Vasilis Aravantinos <coughs> in Thebes have led to the, to the uh, discovery of another uh, ritual, tumulus ritual in the sense that it's not for funerary purposes, but um, it's more like um, the transformation of ruins of buildings into places where certain forms of social communication were carried out. It seems, therefore, that after, that after the destruction of the circular building around 2200, a hitherto unrecognized tumulus was formed out of its ruins and became the point of reference for social memory. The Hundbau tumulus forms a decisive link connecting the distant eras of the early Hellenic period of the corridor houses of the third millennium, named after the House of the Tiles, this is called the Corridor House, because it has corridors in Lerner, this, this building type, and the Rundbau has also corridors, but it's of a completely different architectural type and unique on the Greek mainland. Um, the tumulus, Rundbau tumulus, must have stood as a recognizable monument at least until the beginning of the Mycenaean period, when, between the 17th and 15th centuries, some buildings slowly began to encroach upon the tumulus. Then, in the 14th century, the ruling Mycenaean elite, I would argue also from, it came from Mycenae, this initiative, the ruling Mycenaean elite decided to instrumentalize the remains of the tumulus for new political ends by drawing on the, discourse, on the discourses associated with the monument. By building the central structure of the palace exactly above the tumulus, it was possible to visually integrate it into a long chain of tradition was some sort of uh, invention of tradition. Um, while we know a relatively little about the early pal palatial palace of the 14th century and contemporary structures on other parts of the citadel and its surrounding, the final palatial period between 12, or roughly 1250 and 1200 is accompanied with an unprecedented number of large-scale building measures that have shaped the appearance of the site until today. And we are accustomed of seeing such Mycenaean citadels 
mostly or even, even mainly under the perspective of strategic thinking, defensive thinking, um, and this is not entirely wrong. It's, it's very right to see it in this way in light of this tremendous efforts of, of fortifying such, uh, such citadels with cyclopean masonry. Yet, another important aspect in Mycenaean uh, architecture, palatial architecture, has been overlooked, and this is what I call um, the Mycenaean citadels and palaces as performative spaces, spaces designed until the, the smallest detail, I would argue, for certain forms of social practice, uh, among which, in my opinion, processions were of, of utmost importance. This can be very clearly shown in the way the palace was built, the new palace was built around 1250 in Tyrians on the upper citadel as part of this, of this, of a whole, whole, uh, um, series of, of large-scale um, building activities. The, the heart, at the heart of all ritual uh, activities in Tyrans during the palatial uh, center, palatial period, must have stood the practices that were carried out, carried out along what I would call the central axis, ritual axis of the Mycenaean kingdom, uh, namely the axis linking the the round altar in the pethral altar in the great court with the round ceremonial half in the throne room. The one inside uh, under roof, un roofed space, the other one under free sky. It can be shown that the, that the whole way of reaching the great megaron and the throne room was structured in different parts structured, and this can be shown, from the main entrance of the site to the very, very end in the throne room, this whole sequence is, is uh, subdivided into a sequence of different patterns of movement. Patterns of movement that are distinguished by 90 degrees turns, and then you are faced with the next, with the next gate or proper line, which is also a gate. Here, another one over here, then it comes the great propylon, then comes the little propylon, again a 90 degree turn, and even here, well, when facing the great megaron, you have to take a 90 degree turn, and then you're faced with the, with the um, porch of the great megaron. Now, I think that this pre-configured, this whole sequence of how architecture was structured, pre-configured processional movement that was actually carried out on certain occasions and we know from the linear B texts that the from Pilus especially that the whole that the Mycenaean year was subdivided into festivities and festivals with different names and on such occasions for instance such processions must have taken place in addition, the whole way was also loaded and charged with meaning through symbolic cues. For instance, the, the usage of a, of a very specific stone material of a type, so-called conglomerate of a, of a quality, only found in Mycenae. And it, uh, these are huge blocks used for the, for the uh, if you chart these uh, blocks, you see that they were deliberately used only in highly symbolically charged places, namely the main gate, which is also a copy of the lion's gate in Mycenae, um, the little the little propylon, and then with the highest density for the for the thresholds and other parts um, of the great of the great megaron. About ten blocks, each weighing more than five tons, must have been brought for building this palace from Mycenae. Again, probably in processional mode, a work, what I call working procession. And the distance <coughs> between the quarries and Tyrians is 16 to, to 17 kilometers. It's, it must have been quite a show of the might of the ruler to bring these huge blocks, which were only used in this particular places. Otherwise, they are unknown, this, this material in Tyrians. 
if, from this perspective of a performative space, it would of course be, be very important to know where the wall paintings were situated in this performative space. Unfortunately, the excavations, the old excavations of Heinrich Schliemann and Wilhelm Dörfeld, which uncovered the palace in 1884 and 1885, were quite inconclusive. Because here in red you see the areas in the western and eastern wing of the, of the palace, the areas where still in situ parts of the dados of the wall paintings were still in place, and together with painted, painted floors. Then, but on the other hand, only rather few fragments, at least fra rather few fragments were mentioned by Schliemann and Dörpfeld coming from specific areas. Among them, the first depiction of a bull leaping scene ever found. So before Knossos, this came out in Tiryns, and no one understood why this something that a human being is on top of a bull. So there were wild speculations what this means. Only through the excavations of, of Arthur Evans it became evident what this particular scene means. And then here another fragment. Otherwise, very little fragments of wall paintings that Schliemann would have really desired to have wall paintings. It is rather striking that especially the central part of the palace with the great court and the great Megaron was virtually free of, of wall paintings, although the, this, the central building must have had wall paintings because its floors were painted. But where, where did these wall paintings? A few decades after Schliemann, it became clear where they are. They were all found in fresco dumps on the western slope below the, the palace. In these fresco dumps, the famous scenes came out, uh, which are so characteristic for Terence. The boar's hunt, for instance, the stag scene. These fragments were found in the middle part of these deposits. And we, it's also known that the most, most um, famous uh, wall painting scene from Terence, uh, the, the procession of almost life-sized women of 1 meter 55 height came out in the southern part of these deposits. Until fairly recently, it was thought that uh, in these old excavations in the uh, western slope of the uh, upper citadel, um, that, they, that all these fresco-bearing sediments were entirely, um, have been entirely excavated. And, but it was only through excavations by the uh, Ephorat, by the Greek Ephorat in 1999 and 2000 that it became evident that for reasons we do not know, the old excavations failed to, um, to excavate all of these sediments. So it was possible in this yellow area to carefully excavate um, the sediments with a high number, which again yielded a high number of fresco fragments. <laughs> And just as important, for the first time, it uh, was possible to study the pottery associated with the, um, with the fresco fragments, which enabled to, to, to date the palatial destruction, because it was clear that these fresco fragments were dumped after the, the palace had been destroyed around 1200 BCE. So the pottery associated with the fragments gives you a date for the for the destruction of the palace. This is how it looked, the fragments, uncleaned, cleaned. And it was a quite a long, um, long job of five, four highly gifted Greek uh, restorators who over the years um, puzzled together these fragments. And these gave us some completely new scenes, among them the most interesting a scene of a s small scale or middle scale, middle, middle format uh, procession of height of about 50, 60 centimeters of the figures of female uh, figures of different sizes the, and grouped under such parasols. The biggest figure holding a smaller figure in her hands, which in turn holds a, a, a red and a yellow branch. 
We know the phenomenon of larger scale female <coughs> figures holding smaller figures from an, an earlier fresco, from an earlier published fresco from Mycenae. Um, it's unclear what it means. So when we publish this, this wall painting, the three of us, Alkestis Papa Dimitriou, uh, Ulrich Thaler and myself, we had two different options. Um, the first option is that what is seen here is the fest festival of Theoporia, known from the Linear B texts, um, which refers to the carrying of the goddess or images of the god, goddess. Another opinion, um, and we do not decide uh, because we were we have different opinions, as you, as you understand. The, the second opinion is that it may be a depiction of a, an initiation rite. An initiation, perhaps, of the queen by a goddess, because these, the smaller figure is exactly the same, wears exactly the same dress as the larger scale figure. So it will, um, these are our options, but I, I'm sure that other options will also emerge. <laughs> Besides this most spectacular and, and most well-preserved um, uh, processional the theme, there's also another processional theme of, of equal sized, also 50, 60 centimeter sized female figures, a sitting female figure, and from the way it is depicted, it's on a, on a throne. It's, uh, it's very likely that it's a deity. And the most curious thing are two fresco fragments um, of animals, maritime animals, fish, um, drinking, a fish drinking out of a gold cup. Yellow means gold in Mycenaean wall painting. You see the mouth of the fish drinking from a cup. And the other one is really curious. You see here, it's part of a vessel of, an, of a, what we call a kantavos the handle of the cantaros, and the, the a cantaros handle is held by the tentacles of a shellfish. <laughs> um, this is reminiscent of an old fragment found in, in 1911, in the earlier excavations, um, which the uh, Gerhard Rodenwald, who published the frescoes from Terence, was not able to understand, which showed another vessel, a riton, with the mouth of an animal on the rim. So whether this is some sort of Mycenaean humor, or whether it's a, a mythical, mythological scene, or somewhere else, we do not understand. And uh, unfortunately, these are the worst preserved, uh, this the worst preserved composition. It would be nice to not to see how this uh, fit together to form a composition. But. Let's move away from the palace. I told you that there were a whole sequence of such building, large-scale building measures carried out in the last five decades of the existence of the palace. For the lower citadel, for the first time, got a cyclopean wall of a width of up to seven meters. At that time, a new staircase was built linking the lower town quite directly with, through the middle citadel with the palace the so-called Western Staircase, which was fortified by a huge bastion, also built in Cyclopean masonry. Then, at that time, all corbel, so-called corbel vaults that uh, make Tyrion so special until this day, they were built at that time. Among them, um, tunnels that lead through staircases um, to, a, uh, to water reservoir on the outside um, of the of the town and the area of the lower town, but it's, which meant that people from the inside were able to have a water supply in cases of in case of sieges or other events, and they were of course closed on top of them, so the enemy would not see that people from the inside uh, went down and uh, got water. Then the famous galleries, so-called galleries, with their corridors, and then they built uh, chambers inside the fortification, all showing this corbel vault in corbel vault technique, um, very similar in certain respects to Hittite, Hittite um, 
vaults built exactly at the same time in the in the uh, capital of the Hittite Empire in Hattusha. We know the Eastern Gallery and the Southern Gallery in Tiryns. Otherwise, this feature of galleries, which were probably meant for storage purposes, is unknown. And perhaps, and in all likelihood, the most impressive um, feat of engineering was the redirection of a stream that until shortly before the destruction of the palace had crossed the northern lower town. So you see, this is the old course of the stream, and this stream caused within the 13th century, several times it caused uh, flooding events, which affected especially the area to the north of the Acropolis Hill, the northern lower town. And it accumulated within a fairly short time of several decades it accumulated up to 1 meter 20 of flood deposits. So this, before, before the palace was destroyed, this stream was redirected by building a targeted uh, earthen dam upstream at a distance of about four kilometers from Terence. And redir you see here, that's how the earthen dam looks like on a Greek telephone card the 1990s, <laughs> you see the old stream bed and the new stream bed. They cut the stream bed partially through the rock. And from then onwards, the, this river never affected again uh, Terence. So they really got rid, of it, got rid of it. A tremendous work of engineering. In my opinion, this redirection of the stream was not primarily a protective measure necessitated by these flooding events, although I would uh, concede that these flooding events must have played also a, a major role. But I think it was part of a visionary master plan, architectural master plan, of political actors of the final palatial period. Because it can be shown that exactly at the time of the redirection of the stream, a new North Gate was built also shortly before the palace was destroyed, shortly before 1200 BC. It's one of the last building measures. They introduced a new gate in the north, which to me suggests that they wanted to create a new entrance, important entrance from the north. And for this purpose, it would be a, quite a nuisance to have a stream bed here in this area. So I think this goes along with certain certain um, plans of restructuring the relation between the Acropolis and the lower town. However, then the destruction came in 1200 BC, and, this, and the signs of the destruction you can uh, even noti notice today when you look at the melted remains of building materials in the area of the, uh, of the palace on the uh, upper citadel. It must have been tr tremendous um, fire, tremendous fire. You may be disappointed, but I won't tell you what the cause of this destruction was. I won't tell you, because until a few years, uh, the, um, uh, most people agreed that it must have been an earthquake. Um, I'm skeptical, uh, skeptical about this interpretation. Um, and in recent years, we carried out, uh, together with uh, geo, uh, geophysicists and seismologists, the first project testing the seismicity, how is it, how, that's how it's called, uh, of Tiryns, and whether there are indeed signs of an earthquake, which is a very tricky matter I, I learned. And uh, to, to make a long, long um, story short, I can only say we do not have clear evidence for an earthquake. It's still a possibility, but we must also look in different directions, and these different directions would be hostile, hostile, um, um, warlike events. Um, but I won't go go on, and we jump to the period after the destruction, and this is arguably the most astonishing period of the history of Turing's during which the site developed in a way quite different from the other palatial centers. And in a way, I would call it moved for, for some decades against the currents of history because it was so different um, than other sites that were abandoned or shrank in, uh, in its size, not Tiryns. And, and there are particularly two areas 
in Terence where you can see this unusual development. On the one hand, the upper citadel, and on the other hand, the northern lower town. And these, on these I will focus for the rest of the lecture. You see here what uh, the upper citadel in the ruins, in the ruins of the destroyed palace, a new building was introduced. And when 15 years ago, I, I in the Mycenaean seminar, I gave my first lecture here um, in this house. This was then I presented the uh, then quite new um, excavation results that led to the redating of this of this. Um, of this, how, of this building to the late Mycenaean, to the post-palatial period, because before that it was thought it's maybe a temple of the 8th or 7th century BC. In the meantime, I have worked a lot with the photographic documentation in the German Archaeological Institute of the old excavations, not very uh, th th there are no photos of the excavation of Schliemann and Dörpfeld, but slightly later. And this photo is quite interesting because it shows you the situation of the great court, the great court here, remains of the great court, with this building, building T as it is called, and the underblocks, this gives you a size, uh, an, an impression of the size of the entrance of the great, of the great Megaron. So this new building built after the destruction um, does not use, does not, did not have the same size, was slightly smaller, more narrow than the Great Megaron, um, but built into its ruin. The interesting thing to which I want to draw your attention is this yellow line. This is the yellow, li the yellow line signifies the height of the, of the stumps of the fire destroyed walls in the western and eastern wing of the palace. And if you look at these at this mound of ruin, um, we understand why only in the eastern and western wing remains of the dados were found, of the lowest portions of the wall paintings, because in these two areas, red and yellow, the, the, uh, the, ac the activities of clearance and leveling after the destruction of the palace, but before the building of this narrow mega run, it didn't go down to the to the level of the of the of the of the floor of the buildings, but stopped a few decimeters before. So there, that's why the lowest part of wall paintings are preserved. This, in turn, gives us an unexpected possibility to be more precise where this particular fresco uh, was originally situated, namely the great procession of women, because it's from all the fresco compositions in Tyrants, it's the only one that was torn down to the lowest most part, and in some cases even the floor <coughs> being ripped out, which in my opinion strongly suggests that this particular fresco must have been situated either and or, either in this in the great court or um, the uh, great megaron, for instance, the porch and the antechamber, and moved towards the throne room. So this uh, probably in both areas in this direction. And it finds a parallel in the, in the throne room of Pylos, where a small-scale processional scene also moves in the direction of the throne room. But let us now move to the, to the other area where this unusual resurgence of Tyrants becomes evident, <coughs> namely the northern <coughs> lower town, exactly in this area where previously the stream crossed, had crossed. And on top of these dried out stream deposits, there started new building activities and astonishing building activities right after the destruction of the palace. And we, in, in our most recent excavation carried out since 2013 and funded by the German Research Council since 2014, in cooperation with Alkestis Papa Dimitriou, the head of the local branch of the Greek Antiquity Service, we especially target this area with four new excavation areas and two other excavation areas will <coughs> follow this year. Um, we focus on this area for, ser for several respects. Um, the most important being that 
in this area, people in Terence were able to do something which they were not been able in, on the upper citadel or in any, <coughs> at the lower citadel or anywhere else on the citadel. Namely, to create living spaces and neighborhoods as they wished. Everywhere on the citadel, they had, if they wanted to build new houses, they had to fit them in somewhere in earlier ruins or earlier houses or whatever. Here it was Tabula Rasa in the northern Bay town, so they could create neighborhoods which were ideal, their, which to some way corresponded to their ideas of ideal living. <coughs> That's why we, th it, because we think that there it is possible in this area to get insights onto how people created their own life worlds through architecture. And architecture plays a major role in creating life worlds of humans. We, f we target uh, the, uh, this uh, excavation area with a whole series of microarchaeological methods, some of them well established as archaeobotany, physical anthropology, archaeozoology, some uh, or geomorphological change, um, others uh, more new, innovative, uh, micromorphology and temperature exposure of sediments um, with which we want to understand how halves were used in Mycenaean times. We get a tremendous number of halves in the, uh, in the houses, in, in, within the houses, but also in courtyards and open areas. It's also in other sites we get such halves, but no one knows how people cooked on them. And this we want to find out residue analysis on, on vessels, starch remains and phytoliths on grinding stones, quite new technology, microware analysis on artifacts, um, micro refuse on floors, then DNA of domestic animals uh, with quite interesting results, C14 analysis um, and geoarchaeology, sedimentology, which will follow this year, and geophysics also this year. Um, this is our excavation team from 2015. And um, the excavation up till now has yielded a sequence of two superimposed building horizons that span um, the first half of the post-palatial period. So roughly two generations, 60 years or so. Rough estimates. Clear, it is very clear that it starts immediately after the destruction. How close, or whether it was weeks or uh, months or years, we do not know, but fairly close. And the interesting thing, and also the wonderful thing, is that right below today's surface, you get perfectly preserved Mycenaean houses. It's really an unusual situation, which of course also necessitates an explanation, because certain geomorphological processes led to this. Um, and these, these remains that you see here, these walls, they all date to this period, with the exception of this wall, for instance, and this wall, but other, which do not follow the same uh, orientation as the other walls. All other walls, they follow a, a pattern of orientation already known from other areas of the northern lower town, which, uh, which is one of the indications that this was quite systematic. So we have two building horizons. The first building horizons gave us um, a, a, an insight onto how the settlement was structured. It was, seems to have been structured into rectangular modules with different, um, different orientation. It was structured also into roof spaces and like this building and open areas, this area, roof spaces. Um, open areas. This is something we very typical of the architecture of the 12th century that you have courtyards and houses built around them. One of these houses had one big room here, sub which was subdivided by by at least two rows <coughs> of stone bases for wooden columns. Here you see this room with some of the wooden column bases. One later. Um, we come back to one of these column bases in a moment, but we know this type of architecture already from a previous excavation in the northeastern lower town, 
um, where again such a building was built next to a courtyard and again subdivided by columns, wooden columns, into s several um, parallel rows. At the time, we thought this must be a very unusual type of building because it's so rare outside of Terence. There's one similar building from the excavation of Klaus Kilian in the early 1980s in the lower citadel, but otherwise it's, it's fairly unknown from Greece. So we thought it's really something unusual. But now the second excavation has again yielded such a building. Um, so it must be more common than we think. And my current interpretation is that we are dealing with a building type which was quite rare, but chosen to represent a space perhaps as to function as a building where neighborhood groups were able to meet and uh, in its surroundings and inside the building. I say this because in the surrounding <coughs> of the building exposed in 2000, in this earlier excavation, there was a destruction horizon and there was the whole, a whole set of feasting vessels in the vicinity with cooking pots and drinking vessels ready to be used in a, fest a festive event. And Philip Stockhammer, who analyzed this material, concluded that there must have been a fest, fest, uh, fe feast going on, and uh, then the fire struck and destroyed this building. We also knew from the earlier excavation that in this particular building, but also other buildings of this time, around 1150, uh, 1180 BC, um, Quite large stones were built <coughs> into some of the walls. Here you see the format of some of these uh, s stones. Unusual sizes for, for Mycenaean um, settlement architecture of the 12th century. And we again, also in the new building, have one stone, the cornerstone of this building, which is of unusual size for settlement architecture. And I think this is um, maybe a, a reference to the palatial past of using oversized uh, stones that were very visible, uh, of course, in the fortification to everyone in, in, in very uh, st um, strategic positions as in the corner or very visible positions. Um, a very interesting feature, and this fits this description of the reference to the palatial past, is the reuse of spoliae of stone spolia of the palace, a phenomenon we did not yet know from Terence. And one striking case is the reuse of an ashlar block as one of these column bases in this building. And this ashlar block has a mason's mark on top of it, a Minoan mason's mark, as was analyzed by Vasilis Petrakis, uh, a specialist on linear B and linear A writing from, from Greece. Um, the interesting thing is we know that, that especially the earlier palace on the upper citadel of the 14th century made use of these ashlar blocks, but until now we did not know from Terence one with such a sign on it. And it's striking that they positioned the, the block in a way that the sign was visible. And the, the wooden column was put on top of it, a very symbolic um, means. Another spolia taken from the upper citadel is this fragment of a very unusual stone. And we, when we saw this piece in the excavation, here you see it, we of course recognized that it was cut, that it has cut marks and is polished. But then we moistened it. And uh, this was a very special moment because we all knew where this particular stone must come from. It comes from the monolithic slab 14 t 40 ton slab at least of the so-called bathroom of the palace on the upper citadel. That's the only known case where this particular stone was used in Terence for this block. And they must have uh, chopped off a, um, or got, gotten hold of a fragment of this particular stone and reused it in a house as a step or a threshold. Yes, here you see the bathroom, bathroom here, in the close to the Great Megara. The most unusual and potentially most important piece looks very humble. It's a fragment 
of what I think is a large-scale stone relief. It shows furrows, grooves, um, cut into a surface that shows, in my opinion, but this has to be tested, um, remains of a red paint, of red being red painted. I think it must, it's, it's likely to belong from a relief um, similar to the Lionsgate relief, because we know that such furrows were used to um, exemplify muscles in other parts. We do not, of course, with such a small piece, you never know to what it may belong. But we will be very careful t of looking t for uh, matching pieces in our new excavation series. We know, of course, the phenomenon of the reuse of material culture of the past from other finds of the 12th century, namely the famous Tyrion's treasure found in 1915 in the lower town, in a different part of the lower town, which yielded the spectacular and the largest gold signet ring ever found from Minoan and Mycenaean culture, and reused here. It's an original piece dated uh, by specialists such as uh, Dr. Olga Pliskovska to the 15th century, 14th century, but several centuries earlier. So they, 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 people try to get hold of important items of the palatial period and try to integrate them in their new life. We did not yet know that also stone spolia were part of this game, game um, but it actually they were. I show you here some of the finds of the first building horizon that will be quite quick. Um, we, know, we see that Tyrants were still integrated in wide-reaching uh, con contacts in the Mediterranean. In this excavation, in the whole excavation, the relations to southern Europe, to Italy, are very remark remarkable. We see here a, a, a <coughs> terminated cup with, an ups with a high handle um, of types, uh, very typical for the southern Italy, black polished surface uh, Minoan stirrup jaws, they kept, kept on go coming to Terence and the typical Mycenaean decorated pottery among which unfortunately also very small um, two um, antagonistically pointed um, persons, perhaps warriors, but seemingly shaking hands. It's a nice depiction and it would be nice to have even more of it. Um, in another room we found um, evidence for, for working of metal uh, stone molds for the production of bronze sickles, and in the same room, a actual bronze sickle, but not fitting into this mold, so it must have been produced uh, in another mold. Um, fittings, ivory fittings of perhaps um, furniture, perhaps also saved from the pal palace, and uh, jewelry of bone, bone jewelry. Um, so in the, at the end of the first building horizon, um, there was a large-scale conflagration. It's exactly the same time as the conflagration in the other excavation I showed you. Um, it must have been a major event. You see here the excavation with whole sets of vessels on the floor of a courtyard here or inside a room. Um, you see here the destruction horizon with the black ashy material on top of the floor. Archaeologists like such destructions. <laughs> um, here, a, uh, it's one of the, if not this, uh, ensemble of vessels uh, of the mid 12th century, 1150 or so, uh, with craters and the typical handmade burnished ware, which is also related to southern Europe. <coughs> Um, a, a, sh a boat model, a small one, a, a cup with a perfect uh, match in Lefkandi on Eubea, on the British excavations there, also of handmade burnished ware, um, sets of cooking vessels and also decorated vessels. There are also some special, uh, special deposits which we, uh, and special finds as this vessel, a unique vessel, um, which originally had two handles, but which strikingly has a set of four furrows below the rim and above the base. 
Um, we found, first of all, in the first season already fragments of this vessel, and we said, what is this? We've never seen such a, such a vessel. And in the meantime, I think it's unique in Greece, so, uh, unless someone of you knows it. But what I think it is, is a, a, it is a clay um, um, imi imitation of a bronze vessel, vessel that we know very well from Central Europe, the so-called bronze buckets of type Kult, which until now as bronze vessels are unknown from Greece, but whoever, and this, is, this particular example is one found in northern Italy, and it's it particularly close, also the, the way the handle, I didn't show you the handle here, but it has also the same furrows here as the one from Merlara, published by uh, Dr. Jokovic. <coughs> and uh, strikingly, I think this is a, 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 a clay imitation of such a bronze vestal, and it was also strategically well placed here in the courtyard in a clay, in a clay bed. So it was also placed in a way that sh it showed it was quite important to their uses. Another curious structure associated with this destruction deposit is a stone slab on top of which we found an antler, a large antler fragment, and between um, the prongs of the antler, a kylix, a cup. It could be a ritual deposit, but I'm cautious to interpreting this in a ritual way because, it's, because it could also be a, a um, phenomenon of the um, this sudden destruction that someone wanted to work antler on this, on this particular uh, stone slab, although I think it's unlikely, and especially the, the, the cup uh, in the, here in the situation suggests a ritual use. <laughs> so after, this, after the destruction, the, the, the settlement was in a way reorganized. Some of the buildings were not rebuilt, um, and the, 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 the uh, percentage of, of hippethral spaces was increased. But for the first time, we can uh, ascertain a, a drainage. A drainage built in the mid of the 12th century or short, short, shortly afterwards. And the first uh, evidence for a draining system, which is certainly of late of post-palatial date. So this, th they were, which means that people in that, uh, at the time were still uh, using such um, infrastructure and building it. Associate, we will come back to the drainage in a moment, but uh, let me show you another very interesting <coughs> object from the second building horizon, a fragment of a reused Neolithic figurine, a stone figurine, figurine many millennia older than the context and headless already at that time. They must have picked it up somewhere and brought it to the uh, to the um, to their village. A bronze uh, dagger of the so-called Pertosa type of uh, Italian derivation, as also this lead wheel with perfect comparisons in Italy, and a lentoid, uh, rock crystal lentoid, and a cone associated, and of course pottery, inevitably, and, but very nicely, of course, again, Minoan imports parts of large-scale Minoan stirrup jars, pictorial pottery, probably a horse. Um, horses are always difficult to draw. Um, <laughs> um, craters and typical pottery of this time. Um, but let me come back to the drainage, and especially to this particular situation. There, we found a very curious situation, a platform, a stone platform, the drain comes from this direction, went through this platform, and goes in this direction and leaves the excavation. Here you still see the uh, slabs, covering slabs of the drain. Here we removed the slab. In the middle of this, of this uh, stone platform, there was an opening. And tucked into this opening was this pot of handmade burnished ware. 50 centimeters, 60 centimeters of height, again with perfect comparisons in Italy, and another vessel here. So what is this? We know that the drain went through here and we had an opening here. My interpretation is that this might be a toilet. Um, a toilet with the opening, I won't go into details now, <laughs> may have been used, and that at the end of its use, it was stuck, this uh, closed by putting in this vessel, which may have been even used for certain purposes. 
of course, we took a lot of samples for <coughs> bacteriological, bacteriological um, research, and the research suggests indeed a, quite a pronounced percentage of certain bacteria in this area. But it's too early. We have to take control samples of the Earth in the surrounding, which will tell us how normal or abnormal this presence of these bacteria are. So please bear with me. It will take some time whether, I'm not sure whether we can ascertain this, this interpretation. Yeah, here you see it from another position, the drain coming from this uh, direction, then leaves in this direction and the opening here after the crushed vessel had been removed. In the end, I want to show you another interesting, uh, some interesting features found in an open area in the context of the second building horizon here. There we found a, in this area we found a concentration of ovens. The, already in the beginning of the excavation, we noticed that in this whole area, there was a lot of red clay. And from the experience of our other excavation, early excavation, in 2000 in the northeastern lower town, I thought this may be industrial, an industrial area of kilns, perhaps potter's kilns, or other kinds of kilns, perhaps even metallurgical kilns. But uh, as we went down and uncovered these structures, we found them to be small ovens of all of the same shape, at least three of them, and some earlier ovens totally destroyed of the same type. They are keyhole shape, um, and in the vicinity, and it's in one case, even inside uh, this, um, these, these ovens, these small ovens, we found a type of vessel, so-called vats, of a rather small type, fitting into these ovens that are otherwise very unusual in Tirids. Um, this makes me think, but we do not yet have information of the residue analysis of these parts, that this may be uh, linked to cooking activities, that they stewed something, um, probably a specialty of uh, certain, uh, probably meat dish, um, inside these ovens. Strangely, these kind of ovens from other areas in Terrans are unknown up till now. And this is another important question we are, we are uh, aiming at, at our, in our newest excavation. I think what is called Mycenaean culture is much more, much more heterogeneous than we think. Um, even within the settlement, one and the same settlement, you get very different forms of organization of daily life in between different areas. And we try to, to find this, because by using the term Mycenaean culture, which I do not like, we are, we are suggesting um, that a monolithic, a monolithic um, view of human societies that everyone uh, um, used uh, items uh, and uh, behaved in the same way. I don't think that it's right. In one of the ovens, we found a deposition of five chylicas, which were not linked to cooking activities, but which were deposited after the oven had been opened and the food retrieved. Here you see the, um, the deposition of the five chylicas. This suggests that after a certain event, I would argue again a feasting event, people in, uh, deposited these chylicas, perhaps five people were involved in this festivity in drinking, and then they put their champagne cups in the, in the oven. A few meters to the northwest of this concentration, in this area, the most spectacular find of our, of our excavation, whole excavation, came out in an area where we got a whole sequence of pits in which intentionally destroyed and crushed vessels were found. You see this, for instance, how this vessel, an alabastron, so-called alabastron, was crushed into the smallest fragments. Usually when you find fragments of, of that size, you can be sure that it's not an entire vessel, that it's redeposited the second or third time. If you find this in this state, in one pit together, and then you are able to fit together the whole vessel, then something strange must have happened. And this is the case not only for this vessel, but also to the, the, the most spectacular one 
in another pit, namely this one, a found here the position how it was found. You saw see the human style head and these rings, these curious rings. We were much surprised to put this together and find that it's a highly unusual ritual vessel. Um, and to be exact, a ritual um, um, jug, right on jug, it has to be called. So it's open from the top. You see here a um, animal-faced or human-faced uh, being without a mouth, and then corresponding three corresponding rings, hollowed rings. You put fluid through the head of this being, and then the fluid ran down into this into the supporting vessel, which had an opening in the in the in its base. So it was indeed a riton, but a very strangely shaped riton with a column here in the middle, which is reminiscent, of course, of the column central column of the Lion's Gate, standing on a on an altar. Here you see the altar. And the whole thing has snakes, two, two snakes winding up the body of this vessel and uh, ending on the shoulder. You see the snake sticking out its head on the shoulder of the vessel. This is the handle, by the way, which leads to the back part of the head of this vessel. When I first saw this vessel, I thought this is the first time such a thing was ever found in Greece. Not so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then um, the director of the German Archaeological Institute in Athens said, wait a minute, I know this kind of vessel from Crete. Um, there's a perfect match, uh, which is, however, 300 years earlier from the Palace of Katuzakros in the Iraklion Museum. It is there reconstructed with a fourth ring, um, but I think this has to be rethought in the light of our evidence. It may be much similar, much more similar than ours. The other example, which must have been very close, is found on another in another uh, site on Crete in Mersini, Astrophilia, again with a head, not anthropomorphic in both cases, but otherwise very similar. So actually, we're dating to the 14th century. So the, for certain reasons, in um, I won't go into details now, we don't have the time, but uh, we can be fairly sure that this vessel is not an heirloom uh, 200, 300 years old. Uh, so it's likely that we're dealing with a ritual, a type of ritual vessel that was very rare, perhaps only one per, per settlement, if any, um, and that's why we rarely take notice of them. Going back, however, as so many things in Mycenaean culture, to, to my known predecessors. The whole situation, I think, with these ovens in this area, the deposition of the vessels of the Kailikes here, and the deposition of the crushed vessels here, I think this is related and bears evidence and bears witness for feasting, uh, ceremonial feasting activities in this area, in which after the feasting had taken place, some of the vessels were crushed, others were deposited in the destroyed ovens used uh, in the course of of feasting. But only after about 60 years of dense and intense occupation, this settlement in the, in the part of the lower town was abandoned and uh, after the second building horizon. And only 100 years later, it was reoccupied in the early Iron Age. But the whole second part of the post-palatial period is missing. It seems to me that the large-scale development of the northern lower town immediately after 1200 was meant to implement the unfinished portion of the final palatial master plan, as I call it. It was based on well-conceived ideas on how to structure the new neighborhoods and aimed at accommodating groups of people, many of whom had arrived in Tiryns only recently. And I forgot to tell you that what is really striking here is that we do not get any roads until now, not even pathways connecting these different modules. And I think it was important for these people that other people were not able to move around. And I think the reason for this is that these were people who had not lived in Tyrants before, and especially not together. And in the beginning, if you do, do not, if you have new neighbors, perhaps it's better not to have too many openings in, in your walls. But we 
try to target with the geophysical research in the surroundings how there must have been roads and ma major pathways, but we don't have them yet. But then but we will find them, I'm sure about this. Although the early 12th century north northern lower towns lay out with its grid of interlocking rectangular modules does not bear a close resemblance to the plans of early 12th century BCE Cypriot towns, the comparison to Cyprus suggested already by Klaus Kilian, Klaus Kilian already uh, thought that it, this new planning of a, of, a, of a lower town after 1200 may be similar to Cyprus, and I think he may have something uh, with it. He may have been right, um, because this settlement seems to have been built on preconceived plans how to structure the new life world. As Irini Limos have no, has noted, um, I quote her, although Tiryns, later Latin 3C, post-palatial Tiryns, was of urban fabric and entered a path of social, economic, and political development that could, in theory, lead to urbanization, it never fully reached this stage after later Latin 3C, end quote. While they, while Eri is correct in her observation that the path towards urbanization was, in Terence, was abandoned. Um, I think that the available evidence from the northern lower town suggests that this process of abandoning the town had already begun long before the, the end of the, pe the post palatial period. After the seemingly widespread destruction of the northern lower town in later la in the, at the end of the first building horizon, occupation resumed in the second building horizon, but soon afterwards the process of shrinkage and of abandonment set in and brought a definite end to the course towards urbanization that had been initiated a few decades prior and that could have led to a major urban town similar to Cyprus which never materialized. Thank you very much. Thank you for your...